terms of drilling in and going in more detail in terms of finding the, the type and specific details of the property that you want to purchase, let me ask you this question. Who here has already set up their Google News alerts like I told you to? Well, I'm really disappointed. Congratulations to those, but that would be less than 20% of the room. Okay? Remember, remember I told you about that success cycle? Remember I said you take little actions, baby steps, and they're the steps that will help you get the best results? So what's one of the most important things you've got to do? And turn to the back of your book right now and put in where you've got your action items for yourself or your syndicate. Write it down. And whatever it takes for you to escalate this from being important to becoming a must. By the way... Some of you may even have brought your notebooks. Some of you may be staying in hotels. Some of you may even, the hotel or the location you stay at may even have an internet cafe. Can I suggest this to you? It will take you five minutes to set up a Google News Alert. For those of you who set up a Google News Alert, how long did it take you? Two minutes, three minutes. It will not take you long. You figure out what you want. You get it sent to you on a regular basis. This is critically important for you. Okay? Google com.au or co.nz for the New Zealand young man. All right. You go, you click on the alerts tab. Sorry. You click on the news tab and you click up to set an alert. And you use keywords. Do you remember the keywords you need to put in? Property, real estate, investment. Maybe you put Australia or, or New Zealand or maybe you put New South Wales. All right. You put in keywords like that. You may even want to go and put in keywords such as if you have more than one Google alert, you may want to have things like taxation. You may want to have um, structures. I mean, there's a number of words that you may use, but the key ones are real estate, property, investment. Right? Any one of those words are the sort of keywords you want to be seeing on a regular basis, any news articles. So you'll get a list of them, you'll have a heading, you'll have two or three lines, it'll tell you the source, and if they're relevant, you drill into them. If not, you ignore them. That's all you need to do to be so much further ahead than the general population. And that's free and that's easy. Does that make sense to everyone? Now, once you've done that, you'll know what's going on. But what you need to do is you need to select an area. Something else I suggest at the two-day event, put your hand up if you've done this. Who here has bought a map of their city or their state with the rings on it, the 5K, 10K, 15K rings, 20K rings, put it up on their wall? Who's done that? Okay, guess what else you're going to put on your list of things you've got to do? All right, so number, the other thing you need to do is you need to put, um, you need to buy a map, you know, go on an exciting date with someone, go to Map World. Fascinating. I love Map World too. Do you want to, oh, you're married though. Bugger. All right. Okay. All right. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. All right, go to Map World or go to your local council. They often have maps, and the ones at local council are better. Does anybody remember why the council maps are better? They show what? They show zoning, right? So you can see what can be potentially built there. They, and they may be in too much detail, but that's fine. Because they got the zoning, you get a, a wider scale map and a zoning map. Put them all up. All right. So buy a map, a map that is big enough to show you the rings, and then a map that actually can show you the major infrastructure, such as railway lines, freeways, hospitals, schools, etc. If it doesn't, you get the what and stick them on there? The coloured pins, remember? You do all of that, and then it's done. Now, that helps you identify an area. But then, this is the other thing you need to do, is most properties, bless you, that are sold, are sold in what's called a, st a statistical distribution of a standard bell-shaped curve. Does that make sense? Can I go to flip charts, please? So what you're going to find is that there are properties up this end that are cheap. There are properties up this end that are expensive. And that's where the median is. It, median is not the average. Median is the what? It's the middle. No, that's mode. All right, its median is the middle price. 50% of all properties sold are above that. 50% of all properties are sold below that. Remember that? It's, the, it's by far the most accurate measure of where that market is. 
Average is not. Does anyone remember why average is not? That's right, it can be skewed because of excessive amounts of high or low sales in an area. Can that ever happen? Yeah, you may have a very established suburb, developer releases a lot of stock, bang, of high price stock, it drags the market upwards in terms of influencing the average. A friend of mine is a developer in Coffs Harbour, that's exactly what she, well, she and her partners did. They provided so much stock in one short hit that it actually dragged the market higher and she moved the market herself because of that. So median is by far the, the most accurate. Right, and this is the number of sales. Okay, so number of sales. Now, in some areas, the bell-shaped curve is higher. In other shape curves, it's more spread out. In some areas, it's more skewed one way or the other way. But basically, it's this type of shape. Now, what's really important is you need to understand the type of property that you're buying in terms of the price point of the market. By the way, are some houses going to be cheaper? Sorry, more expensive than units in an area? Yes or no? So you need to bear in mind that when you look at numbers for median prices, you need to maybe differentiate them from houses to units, okay? Now, in terms of where do you buy, well, there could be, and I'm going to show you, I'm going to go through some more detail in a moment, but you need to get the organising principles first, the big picture ideas, and then map the specific information on top of that. This is part of the strategy that I always look for. Is right, if I'm going to do a renovation, I want to buy something that I'm definitely buying below the median price for that type of property in that market. Why? Because I'm assuming that I'm crap at doing renos. Why? Because all I want to do is repaint and recarpet. That's all I want to do. Because if I just repaint and recarpet, is there much chance of, if I've bought it below median and I've just repainted and recarpet, is there much risk of me? Overcapitalizing, yes or no? Not, there's, no? there's virtually no risk of that. Plus, I know that I can do something like that very quickly and I can flip it and trade it very quickly. Does that make sense? Only once you become really, really advanced can you buy something at median or even above median, add so much value, and is that possible? To add so much value that you've virtually recreated that entire property and it sells for considerably more, yes or no? Right, but the market timing has to be right, the marketing has to be right, and your skill level has to be appropriate for the finished product. There's no point putting in five-star stuff and leaving some stuff at three-star because it will not give the overall value. Make sense? All right. Now, when it comes to flipping and trading properties, though, I tend to not do properties down this end because generally those properties are going to be something that's got emotional appeal. I will generally do those properties probably above median, maybe even up this end, right? So I'm looking for properties that are really unique. Why do you think if I'm going to flip or trade a property that I want it to be unique? There's high demand and there's not a lot of other competitors for it. Does that make sense? I want something that is probably going to be above average because it's not for me to hold. Why don't you think I want to hold an above average property? It's too expensive, the yields are generally lower on them, the LVRs are generally lower, the internal rate of return is generally too low. Okay? So when properties are up the skinny end of the bell-shaped curve, I've got to put too much money into them because the LVRs aren't as high. So, so, so the valuum is hard. To get the LVRs as high as possible is hard. To get the highest rents to make it a good yield is hard. Do you like hard work? I don't. So who are these properties targeted at? People that are owner occupiers because they usually pay a what premium? An emotional premium. So if I'm going to do a flip or a trade, often if I've got a property like this and it's furnished or I've got great marketing, that's often where I can get the best return. All right? However, there is risk involved with that. And we're going to talk about ways to minimise that risk. So the risk is I don't want to be stuck with a property like that. That's a huge risk. Would you agree? Right? But this is often where you'll make the most amount of money on a single property because it's appealing to the massive emotional buyer. Right? But I'll show you some strategies of how to minimise that. This section is really about just selecting. Okay? Now, the bread and butter ones that I want to hold and I want to do flips easily. And um, let me tell you, the moment you start getting greedy with this is the moment you're going to have a massive problem. Because then you're going to be waiting longer, holding costs, you're going to stress yourself out. There's no need to do that. There are ways to make a flip or a trade, make some money, but always leave enough profit in there for the next person. Why? Because you get better at doing the process, you get a good reputation, you get comfortable, you understand, and people are willing to work with you. If they know that you're making a bit, but they're making a bit, 
when there's a need to be flexible, when there's a problem, they're more than happy to be flexible. But if they know that you are charging the highest possible price and there's not much upside for them, let me tell you, if you've got some negative, they'll just put it to you. Okay? Would you agree with that? Make sense? Okay. So generally when I'm buying properties, I want probably just above, this is kind of, if I'm buying and holding them, this is where I want them to be. So this is my buy and hold. And if I want to do flips and trades easily, I'll do them there. But if I want to do a flip and a trade to a higher end where I can make the most amount of money, that's where the red one is. But I wouldn't do a lot of those because is it possible that the emotional part of the market can change easily, quickly? Right, that's the most volatile. So, you know, even though this is where you can make the most money on a flip and a trade, um, because it's unique and because people pay an emotional premium, it's also by far the most riskiest part. But I'll show you some ways you can minimise that risk, okay? Um, if you're doing a reno, it's probably up here. So one of the things you need to decide to do individually and as part of your syndicate, right? Because part of your syndicate, could you be doing more than one play at the same time? Let's say there's 40 people in your syndicate. Let's say you're from New South Wales. Could you have a subgroup that is looking for and targeting properties to do quick renos on? Yes or no? Right? Could you have another group that's targeting how do we find developers and do bulk takeouts? So I'm going to be t teaching you a lot of strategies. In fact, by the time we get to the end of this, it'll all tie together. Everything that we're going to learn all the way through this are all the basic building blocks of how do you as a syndicate get outstanding results and how do you then have an ability to get much deeper and better discounts and minimise your risk substantially. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So... Make sense so far? All right, you got to give me feedback. Yes. yes? All right, now, one of the other things that goes on, and this is what I, I call Doppler shifts. Any science people in the room, who knows what a Doppler shift is? All right, okay. I'm a bit of a science geek, but I call these Doppler shifts. The, no, I can't, and I'll tell you why. Um, based on this, is it going to vary from market to market? Are some bell-shaped curves going to be more spread out? Are some going to be tighter? By the way, how do you find out some of this information? I'll answer that right now. All right. Firstly, at a high level, how do I find out at a high level where do I start investing? Well, I use um, information sources such as BIS Shrapnel. That report's like $900. You may choose not to be able to buy that. Could you go to your Google News Alerts who do buy these reports and who get press releases from BIS Shrapnel and use that as a guide, yes or no? Yes. Right? Could you go to Macquarie Bank, download their Property Outlooks report, yes or no? Could you get um, Google news alerts from people like Real Estate Institute of Australia, Real Estate Institute of, of New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland or any other jurisdiction? Could you get information from Australian property monitors, from Residex? These companies generally put out news alerts on a regular basis. Remember what I said at the two-day event? How do I pick? Because there could be one group of experts saying this, another group of experts saying this, and another group of experts saying this. How do you pick? How do you pick? Common ground. Now, is that a perfect system? Well, I'll tell you what, it's better than sticking your finger in your mouth and, and holding it up to the air. Would you agree? So if one group of experts have said this and you understand their reasons and another group of experts say this and you understand their reasons and you can independently verify those reasons and those reasons make sense to you based on all the other things you hear, I think that's probably one of the best places to start. Would you agree? Okay. So by getting all that stuff, and that's why I still prefer to read newspapers because I don't know what I don't know. Does that make sense? So by flicking and reading, I capture all these headlines and go, oh, I never thought of that. And I'll rip that out. And it, wouldn't, it wouldn't have been one of my normal keywords, but I go, I never thought about that, or that's interesting. I'll, ma I'll make use of that. Okay? So um, there was something the other day I picked up on um, a new IPO. And this IPO was going to be, it was, I think it was early childhood learning systems or something. They're going to be competing with ABC Learning Centres. Right? But do people want to have proximity to their childcare? Yes or no? As soon as they're part of a group, do they have more resources to provide better marketing and better resources to children? Yes or no? Do parents want to send their kids to places where they get the best starts? Yes or no? So, 
maybe by picking that up, I can think, okay, where can I find these early childhood centres that people don't want to send, and I didn't use this terminology, they did, they don't want to send their children to the McDonald's of the early childhood industry. Now, I don't know whether that's fair or unfair, I'll let you decide, but but they were going to let each of these individual centres take on their own persona that was specific to the cultural and awareness of that area, so it made it unique and special, but still leverage off the power of having like a, like a much bigger branch or much bigger group providing all the IP to it. Does that make sense? So could some people choose that as a preference to differentiate one centre over another centre, yes or no? If they did that, people want to live close to where their children go or there's good established childhood centres and maybe good schools, could that have an effect on property prices, yes or no? Do people like to stay close to where their children go to school and do parents often have more than one child, right? So one of their child goes to local school, the other one goes to local um, preschool, right? So things like that are not normally on my radar. I haven't put them in my keyword searches. That's why I still prefer to flick read newspapers. Make sense? Okay. So once you've gathered all that, and as, oh, this is a great example. Um, I'm still on flip charts. This was in one of the newspapers. When a government spends money on building um, infrastructure, such as railway lines, roads, airports, what does that do to property prices around it? Pushes them up, doesn't it? But sometimes building these things, is not, it doesn't happen overnight, does it? How long does it take? Five, ten, sometimes 20 years or more. But, you know, here's the funny thing, that sometimes people... Once it's built, they go, oh, property prices are going up. I better be a sheep and jump in there. Whereas they could have done their research a little bit beforehand, gotten in much sooner, and they could have captured so much more of the uplift. Make sense? So how do you find out about these? Real easy. You look for inserts like this. This is put out by the Queensland government. I think this was in the Australian, I think. Um, but this is August 2007, building tomorrow's Queensland today. Talks about the key projects for southeast Queensland. And I don't know whether you can see this, but I'll put it up here so you might be able to see it a bit better. Uh, oh, oh, it doesn't matter. But it shows each of the little dots tells you exactly what they're doing, right, with a number and a date and a time frame and what it's called, right? Now, do you think that, that would be good to know? Right? Every state government does exactly the same thing. So this is from, I'll put the link up here so you can download this yourself. It's www.infrastructure. Oh, ran out of space. www.infrastructure.qld.gov.au. Every government department has information like this. Based on once you found from BIA Shrapnel, from Macquarie Bank, from Australian Property Monitors, from the Real Estate Institutes, all of these, and the economic think tanks, based on what you're doing in terms of your Google News Alerts, right? could you have, come, could you have formed a view of, well, which is the states that I want to focus on? Which are the cities that I want to focus on? Could you then use things like this to um, drill in on the best places in those cities and states? Yes or no? Right? Then... What you do is you get magazines like Australian Property Investor Magazine. Who's already subscribed to this? Well, those of you who haven't, every one of you should, okay? Um, or go visit someone who does subscribe. <laughs> all right? But in the back, it's got all the median prices, right? Um, it's got the number sold in the suburb. It's got, um, the, you know, it's got all the information that you need for each one of these suburbs, right? Median growth, um, everything. Right? Could you use that as your guide for something like this? Yes or no? Real Estate Institute of Victoria, New South Wales, Queensland, all the other major jurisdictions, they do the same sorts of things. You can find out median prices from places like Australian Property Monitors, from the local real estate institute of that jurisdiction, right? and or from value general or government data. I don't really prefer the government data because often it's conservative, often it's on unimproved land value, so it's not quite reflective. Generally, I find that the um, Real Estate Institute of whatever and also the Australian Property Monitors, um, where they source their data for this, I don't know if it says. 
Based on that, could I go to the abs.gov.au and if you're looking in New Zealand, you go to stats.gov.au. Right, if you're in New Zealand or you're looking to invest in New Zealand, because then you can start overlaying some of the other trends. Now, you remember I did the exercise at the two-day event between supply and demand. Who remembers that? Sorry, we talked about all the drivers for growth. Who remembers that? Did it on the flip chart? All right. Now, part of that was population as an example, correct? Right, and there was some of the drivers were supply-side drivers. Others were demand-side drivers. Remember that? All right. You're, some of you aren't too familiar. All right. Population was a which side driver? Demand side driver. And you may recall that I said that there was a thousand people a week moving to Melbourne. Who remembers me saying that? I lied. It's more. It's 1,400 a week are moving to Melbourne. Now that's... Ex Why? Why? <laughs> You're obviously not Victorian, are you? Where are you from? New South Wales, all right. Well, I, I've, lived, I've lived the vast majority of my life in New South Wales, but I've moved down here because of, I've seen some amazing opportunities. But um, where in New South Wales do you live? Oh, okay, all right. Um, look, in New South Wales, l let me tell you, affordability, who's heard that affordability is a big problem in Australia? Who's heard that? Massive, massive affordability issues. Um, and Sydney, Brisbane, Darwin, Perth, are incredibly unaffordable. Melbourne has got much, much better affordability. In fact, when I came down to Melbourne, I started looking at house and land packages, I thought, it's missing $100,000. It was just, I, and I'd invested, I've invested all over Australia, um, and I've looked in New Zealand, in Auckland, um, but I've invested in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, and Perth. And I was used to the prices in Sydney. I was used to what was comparable value in Queensland. And Perth has just gone nuts, right? But I looked at some of the prices in Melbourne and I thought, for $250,000 for a house of land that's like 20 k from the city, that's insane. It needs to be another 100000 to be even close to parity in Sydney. Give you an example. Some of the blocks of land that I've seen in Victoria, right, and um, I've I've said this story before, so I'll just summarise it. I grew up in the western suburbs of Sydney, right, where it was cow pastures and rolling hills and orchards at Carlingford near Parramatta. Um, when we moved there, um, it wasn't, there was nothing there virtually. But after they put a freeway in and that suburb became established and good schools and shopping centres sort of came about, it's an average suburb. It's probably an above average suburb. And... Uh, Average property prices there are probably around six fifty to seven hundred thousand, and in fact, in some pockets, it's well over that, like closer to a million, right? But it was paddocks before that. The reason I know that is my uncle had a commercial flower farm out there because the land was cheap. Now, I went to Melbourne and I've invested in who's heard of suburbs such as Port Melbourne, who's heard of Port Melbourne, Hawthorne, Eaglemont, Maribyrnong. Are they reasonably good suburbs? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and St Kilda. Well, so I've invested in all of those. I went out to the western suburbs. I saw exactly what I saw in Sydney. But Sydney is more hilly. Melbourne, out of places like Tarnit, Truganine and Wyndhamshire and places like that, which is physically one of the most closest areas compared to the five or six that the state government's looking at developing, physically it's the closest with the easiest access. Why? Because you've got the Princess Freeway going to Geelong, which is eight lanes in some parts. Four lanes one way, four lanes the other way. And unlike Sydney, it's not a tollway. It's free. And... It goes straight to the middle of town, unlike you know, some of the freeways in Sydney, some of them stop at Strathfield. <laughs> right? So you know, you can literally be in Tane Truganina and drive in and be in the city in 20 minutes in non-peak. In peak hour, it's going to take longer, obviously, but it's not stop-start. In fact, you could live there right, and be in town faster than if, even if you lived in St Kilda and had to go through all the traffic lights. Does that make sense? Or Elwood. I used to live at Elwood. Okay? So I saw tremendous opportunity. It was flat. If you've ever had to do house and land and build and do filling of concrete, right, you know how expensive that can be, right? And I just saw amazing opportunities. And I knew that a block of land started about 110K or 120K um, or thereabouts, the same block of land, if I bought in Sydney, would be probably about 280 to 350. And it wouldn't be 20 k's. It would be out past Liverpool, Campbelltown. It would be like, what, 50, 60 k's? Maybe even more. 
right? Even if you went to Brisbane, the property, the land prices are more expensive. Perth, it's unbelievable how expensive they are, right? But in Adelaide, who's from South Australia here? Anyone? No one? No one from South Australia? Really? Okay. Because in South Australia, the property prices are low, but the economy is not so strong. But something's about to happen in South Australia, which would just be unbelievable. The people from Perth understand this, and some parts of Queensland understand this, such as the Gladstone, Mount Isa, sort of um, Townsville sort of area. It's called mining. Olympic Dam in Adelaide is going to be unbelievably big. It's, it's apparently going to be one of the biggest uranium mines in all of the world. Now, is the world moving towards cleaner fuel because of greenhouse? Yeah. Whether or not you agree with uranium or not, the world's moving towards it. Would you agree with that? And we are going to be the largest provider potentially in the world of this sort of um, resource. Olympic Dam is really going to be one of the largest in the world. Some of those properties in the northern suburbs of Adelaide are dirt cheap and the yields are good. What do you think is going to start happening when... Has anyone ever been to Caratha or Dampier here? All right. If you've ever been there, it's a very different world. It's very different. Let me tell you, some of the yields on those properties are sky high. Why? Because often the mining company pays for it and they're making tons of profit. Or you've got maybe two or three miners who fly in, fly out, so they work maybe two weeks on, one week off or something like that. And to them, sharing a house, an additional house, even though they, don't live, they only live there when they're working, it's nothing. It's pocket money. All right? So some of the rents that you'll be able to get around mining places, and particularly its proximity to Adelaide, I, I think um, the South Australian economy will just boom because of it. If you've seen what's happened in Perth, I think the same sort of thing can happen in Adelaide. Right? But in Melbourne right now, you've got such a diverse and broad economy, and realistically it's the second biggest financial centre of all of Australia, right? and it's arguably the cultural capital of Australia and the sporting capital. Right now, why do I say that? Well, the AFL, the well, hang on, the um, Melbourne Storm. They didn't they just win the um, NRL? Who cares? Um, the, the AFL didn't Geelong Cats just win that? The soccer, um, what's that? Melbourne Victory, I think. Victory, they just won it. Um, right, you've got the VRC, the the racing. Um, you've you've also got the food, the wine, the the Grand Prix, the arts, the fashion. Uh, Everything, right? You've got everything down here. Sorry, the women. Oh, the weather. I think you said women. Okay. <laughs> the weather. <laughs> the weather. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, all four seasons in one day. Well, actually, it's four seasons sometimes in 10 minutes, right? But who likes variety and change? <laughs> all right. So anyway, there's... The, um, the ability, and what's the great Australian dream? To provide yourself and your family a roof over their heads that's affordable, that you could live in, that you enjoy, that's in good proximity to good work and um, a great economy and cultural benefits and social benefits. And people here in Victoria, particularly Melbourne, compared to, say, Sydney, it's a lot more about the... They've got more time. The infrastructure is better. You can get around easier, right? They've got a better quality of life because it's so multidimensional. A lot more of them have pets than they do in Sydney, um, and they just have more quality time. There is much more of a social dynamic and a social, a valued social dynamic or component to life than there seems to be in Sydney. Sydney, it's all about who do you work for and where do you live, right? And it's and and what you drive, yeah. Uh, <laughs> But it's also, you have to work so hard to actually maintain the mortgage payments in Sydney that doesn't give people enough space to think outside of that. Does, does that make sense? So the quality of life, arguably, is much better in Melbourne than it is in Sydney. Arguably. And I've lived in both, and I love Sydney, but I'm almost starting to turn a bit. <laughs> yeah, where's the loyalty? Yeah, thanks. Um, all right, so anyway... Um, so, so based on all this, you need to start understanding where, are the, where do I start drilling down, drilling down, drilling down from a macroscopic helicopter point of view down to a more and more and more and more specific area. Now, do you think in a syndicate you can actually achieve this much more easily? Do you think as a syndicate, rather than just picking one suburb yourself and trying to do all the research, could you actually, as your syndicate, 
buddy up with someone who holds you accountable and shares that load for that suburb, and then you have maybe three or four other subcommittees targeting a few more suburbs, yes or no? Could that then accelerate the amount of information that you do? Okay, I want you to think about that that's a massive, massive benefit of being part of a syndicate, meeting regularly, sharing information. Now, the reason we talk about a level one syndicate is you cannot have any money sharing going on. Why? Because you don't know each other well enough, something can go wrong, and you've got to just, and this is the saddest thing about the property industry, you've got to assume that everyone's making secret commissions. You've just got to assume that. Just assume it, and then it's fine. This is what, no, no, just assume it. Because you don't know who is and who's not, it doesn't really matter. This is what matters. If you're buying something that you've identified as a good price, whether, they've, whether they're making a one dollar out of you, whether they're making a million dollars, like I don't care. If I know that I've bought it at a good price, that's the only thing I can worry about. That's the only thing that's important to me. Make sense? Yeah. Right? And I'll do tons of due diligence first to make sure that I've bought it at the right price. Right? Now, if they bought it for a dollar and they're selling it to me for 400000 I'm still happy that I got it and it's worth 500000 I'm still happy. But now I'm going to start asking some more questions like, so tell me, what did you do different to me? So I can actually keep improving and keep improving. Who follows that? Okay? That's the only thing you can really think about is, have I got a good deal out of it? Not worry about what they got. Not be jealous. Just be commercial. Have I got a good deal out of this? Right? But as a syndicate, you'll be in a position to leverage off other people's knowledge and contacts and be able to do much, much better deals. Okay. So we've talked about all that from a high-level point of view. Now let me just explain to you what I believe about Doppler shifts. And this is kind of a, a little bit of a, a scientific geeky concept, but it actually fits, and I'll tell you why it fits in property. Um, I used to have this cool T-shirt that had um, Einstein in Doppler and it had a picture of him with red shift on the, on, on the back and blue shift on the front, which means that as, as light gets stretched, it becomes longer wavelength, so it becomes red, and as you get closer to it, you get squeezed, and so you get blue shift. So anyway, that's how um, scientists measure whether stars are accelerating at the speed of light or away from us or getting close to it, whether it's the red shift or the blue shift. Right? So what I do is like I think about all these concepts, how do I apply them to property, how do I make money out of property using Doppler shifts? Is that a pretty interesting question to ask? <laughs> all right. <laughs> this is why I sit up in the middle of the night, Eureka, and I just grab a pen and paper and write stuff down because um, I'm always asking myself really interesting questions like how can I use that? What does that mean? And sometimes nothing pops out, but you will be surprised when you think, well, how does it pop out? So this is what I believe. I believe in a normal market, you have a range of, of values for a particular property. I also believe that um, in a really bull market, those property prices get shifted upwards. Does that make sense? So in a really strong, like right now we have a very strong residential market, um, a very low vacancies. In fact, they're at historic lows. They're at, um, what is it? We're looking at about, um, in most capital cities, it's like below 1%. And in the best parts of those capital cities, I think Frank, who's our um, advocate, our property advocate will come in. He'll tell you some of the stats at the moment. They're like below half a percent, which is just insane. It's absolutely insane. Normally, you're looking at 2 to 3% vacancy rates, but we're well below that at the moment. So, so I believe in a bull market, you're going to get that, right? Where rents rise. Would you agree with that? They accelerate away from you. When you actually have a bear market, um, I'll just I'll put it over this side. What happens in a bear market? Let's say the economy that, um, you know, there's not enough jobs and people are losing their jobs and they have to tighten their belts. When they tighten their belts, they spend less, correct? And that has a flow-on effect. They settle for less. And I'm exaggerating this, but to illustrate this point, right? My preference is if I'm looking for properties that are going to be rented most often that will give me the highest yield, I want the ones that will overlap. So for me, I will probably want to buy these sorts, which is probably above average for normal. It's at the high end if it's a bear market, right? But 
at the bull market, it might only be in the middle. Now, why am I doing that? Well, in a, in a um, bull market, if you have got an amazing penthouse with great views, you can rent it for people at the highest possible prices. No problem, because it's unique and special, and they're, just got, they're rolling in money. But what happens when the inevitable change happens? They stop leasing it, or they can't pay the rent, you've got to turf them out, then who do you rent it to? Some of the properties at the very top end of the market are very hard to rent in a bad market. Does that make sense? Because people downshift. Well, you've got no one downshifting to it. They're downshifting into cheaper properties. So in terms of a Doppler shift, I'd rather not be at the very top end of that market. I'd rather be at a market where people can either move up into or move down into, but it's a little bit above average in a normal market. Does everybody understand that? And that is also my belief right, in terms of buying properties as buy and holding properties, as opposed to renovating, as opposed to flipping and trading them. Does everybody understand that? So this is my Doppler shift. And I'm sure it's AR or ER. Is it ER? Doppler shift. So these are some of the organising principles that I then overlay on when I do find properties, right, based on my macroscopic helicopter view, of state, then, um, then city, then suburb or area. Then I start looking at median prices. And this is some of the rationale that I use behind those median prices for buy and hold or for renting. Okay, does that make sense to everyone? So remember, this is all part of your overall system that you've got to build for your syndicate now. What are some of the organising principles that you come up with that you then give as a mandate to the people in your team to start looking and sourcing for properties and then as a further mandate to the people who actually will do the negotiation. Everybody follow that so far? Yes? yes. Okay, great. So now when we start drilling in, all right, inner city properties, brand new. Now, um, ignore the prices because how, where are you going to get your prices from? What did I say you're going to get your prices from, ladies and gentlemen? Median prices from Australian Property Monitors, Real Estate Institute of whichever jurisdiction you're in, for the appropriate types of property. So there are some that are going to be cheap in, in outer areas. There are some that are going to be more expensive in closer areas. Does that make sense? So ignore the prices because it's going to vary from city to city and how close or how far away you are from the capital of that city. Okay? So... A one-bedroom apartment, so this is for brand new. What are some of the very specific selection criteria that you need to look for? All right. If you're not sure where we're at, we're on page 10 of your book. One-bedroom apartment should be 55 to 60 squares, uh, sorry, square metres with one bedroom and a study area. Must have one secured car park space. The main bedroom must be a minimum of four by three and a half metres. I've seen some bedrooms um, that are three by three and a half. And let me tell you, you can't get anything in on those and you can't even close the doors properly. And tenants don't like them, right? And even owner occupiers, well, what they do sometimes is they will actually put a bed in there Right, that's a double bed, not a queen bed. Right, to to show that oh, you know, it's it's like plenty of space and stuff. It's that's not really the case. You just got to be careful of those little tricks. Okay. Conversely, if you're selling one, is that something you could actually use for marketing purposes? Yes or no? Of course you could. All right. So these are the, the key things that, that that are in highest demand. Right. And you see, we're moving into an era which, you know, the ABS long-term stats have actually helped identify this. And I, di I did mention stats, but um, can I go back to flip charts for a second? You will find that there has been a long-term trend towards fewer density, um, the, the people density is reducing in households. So there are fewer and fewer and fewer people. What does that mean? We are, as a nation, as a society, moving towards fewer people in those homes. So that requires a different type of property stock. You know, some of these big houses that people used to live in on big blocks of land, who here loves to do maintenance on their spare time? Mowing lawns, cleaning windows, cleaning facades, who loves doing that? Look around you, no one loves doing that. Would you love to instead go for a, a run in the park or go to the movies or hang out with friends in an alfresco area or do something like that? Who loves to do stuff like that, right? So we don't have as big families, we don't have this nuclear family as much anymore, and we're very time poor. So the type of stock we're moving towards is very different to what we've had in the past, 
right? Now, one of the things I'm going to suggest to you is part of what you can look for in ABS is, is this is something I mentioned that you may not have all picked up, is um, when you check out your stats, look for where the highest proportion of single males are and the highest proportion of single females are, right? Now, there's only a couple of examples I know, right? And this helps, this is useful for many reasons, right? Well, one of the, one of the, I'm looking at it from a property perspective, all right? <laughs> all right, um, for instance, in Sydney, men prefer to live closer to where they work. So they'll live at Piermont, Ultimo, places like that. Women prefer it to be a little bit more detached from work and they'll go to villages such as Balmain or Roselle. Now, think about this. Um, who looks after properties better, men or women? Women. <laughs> women, very clear on that. Definitely women look after them much, much better. If you've got a whole bunch of single women living together, in terms of rent, if you put up the rent for the household by 30 bucks, it's 10 bucks a pop or 15 bucks a pop, it's not that much, it's easy, right? But if you do it for a household that's single person earning income with um, a spouse and dependent children, as a unit they make common decisions together and they may just move, Right? So it's much easier to put rental increases up and maximise rent on an ongoing basis when you've got individual people sharing. Make sense? And for something that's better looked after, I prefer women to men. Now, in Brisbane, all I remember is the women live at Tawong, right? Because it's kind of, it's more villagey, you know, the Tawong village is actually nice and it's not as close to the city. Um, in Melbourne, all I remember is that... Um, South Bank is where the guys live, right? Women prefer to live at like Elwood and um, St Kilda and those sorts of places because they're just a little bit further out. So understanding those demographics can certainly help you identify areas that are to be maximised for, um, for rent and for on-sale, resale. Because has anyone ever been to St Kilda and particularly Elwood? Elwood's a great example. Is Elwood a lovely place in Melbourne? Yes or no? Yep. It's on the water there. You've got a couple of little villages there. It's just brilliant. Love it there. Okay, so that could be part of your overall um, guidance for picking areas using ABS stats. And because in the past, if you go back 10 years, back to the slideshow, thanks, if you go back, one bedders weren't that popular. Often developers wouldn't even build one bedders into a development. But you see, because we've got more and more people living by themselves, um, people that are divorced, people that um, maybe don't have kids or will never have kids or something like that, you're tending to find these one bedders are getting more and more popular. You don't find them in older stock, right? Unless the whole building has been renovated specifically for that. Um, these are the sizes. Two or three bedrooms are very popular. Again, people don't have time. They want low maintenance. Happy to have a bigger balcony or an alfresco area. They don't want to have a lot of maintenance. Okay, these should be 85 to 110 square metres, two separate bathrooms and a shower area. These have to have, one's got to be an ensuite, and one's got to be a separate sort of bathroom. The ones I really prefer, that I really, really love, are tenants love, and by the way, once you're in your syndicate, could you actually start influencing a developer? Because if you're taking out just one, do you have much influence? No, but if you take out maybe 20 in a development, do you start having massive influence, right? And even if you don't do something on that first deal, can you then do something on the next deal, right? So it's too late to change floor plates. They've already been um, quoted by their builders. The architect's already done it. All the engineers have worked out everything. It's too late. But in the next deal, could you do this? You know what? One of my favourite properties I ever bought was this. Can I go to flip charts, please? And this was in St Kilda, Right? It was in a building, um, and what it was, was you, it was a square shape, but you actually entered, the, the balcony was here, so that's balcony, or something like that, but you entered here, that was the entry, and you actually had sort of bedrooms, and I'm, I'm not very good at drawing this, but that was bedroom number one, that was bedroom number two, and you had, um, I think it was bathroom there, right, and I think you had like kitchen there, anyway, I'm... I'm just illustrating a point here. The first bedroom actually had, that was an ensuite, and this bathroom was actually two-way. So think about this. The bedrooms were separated, and each bedroom had more or less its own ensuite. Even though the second bathroom, which was a two-way bathroom, 
right, had a washing machine in there, how often are you really using that washing machine? Not every day of the week, correct? So this person had pretty much the effect of having their own ensuite. And there was only one, there was only, um, there was four different floor plans on that building, right, because it was an ovoid building. And all the other ones had um, curved walls, and I actually don't like curved walls because furniture is what? Square, right? And um, the way they had it on every one of the other floor plates was the two bedrooms and one bathroom, and you had to walk to that bathroom. This was by far the better floor plate. Make sense? All right? And if you're a tenant, would you prefer this sort of floor plate? Yeah, people loved it. So even though you may not be able to influence the developer straight away, right, as a syndicate, you can get in and say, okay, we love that development. Let's do the next one together. Let's have some input into the development plans. One to, one to two secured car parking spaces. Each car parking space could be worth 20, 30, even more thousands of dollars. Why? Particularly in inner suburb areas where you can't get permits to park. And in Victoria, it is just so hard. As an example, um, a friend of mine lives um, down Barclay Street. If you know where Barclay Street is, it's one of the main streets that goes into St Kilda. She happens to live in residential properties behind commercial properties, right? But she's in that part where there's no car parking and she can never, ever apply for a, um, a car parking sticker, right? So she has to park somewhere in there. And I said, look, why don't you just park in one of the streets closer? No, because you need a permit. And I said, well, but you live in the suburb. You see, in some jurisdictions, particularly in Sydney, if you get a parking permit in some council areas, it's for that council area. But in some other parts, it's per street. If you live on that street, you can only get it for that street. You can't park elsewhere. So some of these things you need to be a little bit sort of cautious of. Now, that's why some of these car parking spaces, depending on the jurisdiction of the council, can be worth a lot of money. Now, could you even negotiate this? Could you even negotiate that if a builder has spare parking spots, could you even get those parking spots and buy them off them? Because they may have, they, they'll have some restrictions in offering some, but the council will force them to have a certain number for, um, what do you call it, um, uh, visitors, but they could still be some left over that, that they can't really do much with. So what they're willing to do is maybe even sell you an extra one or two, because that could make your property really unique and really special. One of the properties that I had up on the Northern Beaches had four spots. In fact, there were two doubles, right? So it was two side by side, another two behind them. And that made my property worth so much money because everyone else just had one spot. I had four. Right, it was a penthouse, but I had four. And something like that is just worth a lot of money. So bear in mind, and the best person to tell you what this is worth is an agent, but particularly if you actually have properties in older established areas, where generally older established areas, they're gonna be, you know, there's um, properties were built without any off-street parking anyway. Those sorts of properties with car parking are worth so much more than in maybe other areas. So just bear that in mind. Um, townhouses. Townhouses are by far the most popular type of property that people live in now with their families, by far. Townhouses should be three bedrooms, 130 to 150 square metres, with an ensuite and a separate bathroom shower. Must have one or two car garage, extra open space for the car, so a bit of a driveway or somewhere to park. Um, now, townhomes give the feeling of having a separate home that's not necessarily attached to other people. So it's house-like features... But because they're two stories, it makes good use of space, um, and it's great. So it's great quality, it's, and it's great value because to build that sort of size, townhouses are not built using commercial design principles that they build in multi-story buildings, right? They're the most popular in-demand properties, favoured by the under 40s of age. Most Australians do not want the hassle of home maintenance, but still want the space, privacy, entertaining advantage of, of a living space. Some of these, all they have is a really nice alfresco area, right, that doesn't need lawn mowing, that can just be swept down if and when you choose to do it. And that's the thing that's most popular amongst people in their, you know, under 40s with their kids. Townhouses also, this is an interesting concept, they offer the best bang for buck value of all inner city properties due to their lower domestic construction costs. Remember, a townhouse is built using pretty much normal 
domestic housing construction methods, finishes and techniques. But units are not. Units have to be done via commercial construction, right? Commercial construction, um, they actually um, are very expensive and they're most volatile because what's going on right now in the economy? We've got 33-year historic lows, unemployment to 4.3%, economic growth is going through the roof, right? Businesses are expanding, correct? Businesses, when they expand and or refurbish, they spend a lot on commercial construction. Now, that type of residential property is competing against commercial property, right? And because of that, the costs of that style of residential, which is units, is growing faster than residential for townhouses. Does that make sense? So the bang for buck on residential is better on townhouses than it is for units of the same size. But remember, units are about are smaller than townhouses, but if you got a unit the same size as a townhouse, the cost would be much, much higher, often twice in terms of dollars per square metre. Okay? So apartments can cost $3,000 a square metre or a lot more depending which city you're in. Townhouses could be 1000 again, depending which city you're in. Okay? There's a, there's a, a huge difference. What about uh, established properties? Established properties, one bedroom apartment should be 60 to 75 square metres, one car parking space. What you tend to find with established properties is that they, are, they have different things about them, such as because they're older properties, they're often in smaller developments, right? You will probably find higher ceilings. You will probably also find much more ornate which means higher maintenance. But also more ornate means more unique, more emotional connection. So when you have more emotional connection, what does that do for the rentability of it? It's unique. People want to rent it. They love it. They fall in love with it. It's got charm. It's got great charm. All right? So established can be good, but just be very careful of the maintenance issues. Some, some of these properties you may have to fully rewire and or replumb. You may have walls that are actually out of plumb. You may have rising damp. You may have a whole lot of issues and you've just bought yourself a whole lot of problems. And established properties generally do not come with a building warranty. In a building warranty, if you're buying something worth three or $400,000, would you like to have a warranty? I like to. Not everyone does. That's fine. But be aware of that. Okay? Um, yeah, there's, there's no depreciation. There's a whole lot of negatives to them, but there's also some positives. Why? Because they're in established areas. There may not be any stock being built that are new. So if you want to get into that market, this may be the only way. And generally, because they're more established, they're probably closer to the high streets or the lifestyle areas. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, two or three bedroom apartments should be 95 to 130 squares with two separate bathroom shower. You may not get this. Many older properties, you won't get that at all. That's just the way life is, right? Unless you become an advanced renovator and you can actually redo the floor plates, but if you've got a body corporate, you just made life unbelievably hard for yourself and there's no need to do that. Um, three bedrooms should have a lock-up garage. Okay, townhouses should be three bedroom, 130, 150, two separate bathroom showers, one garage, 150 to 400. How do you find these numbers again? Just to remind you, you look for the median prices in that area for that type of property. If you're unsure, who do you go to? You go to your local real estate agents in that area. You start looking at all the open for inspections. You get an idea of what the median is, so you know what your target is. Now, here's a very important point. You should put a circle around this in your books. Number four, only purchase established secondhand properties for refurbishment purposes. Now, what does that mean? Your ability to make money is your ability to add value. Have I shown you over 50 ways that people are adding value to property, yes or no? When you buy a refurbished property, they've pretty much already taken all that value out and you're paying a premium for it, correct? You don't want to do that necessarily because is that smart or is that dumb? It's probably dumb. Now, you've had all the work done for you, that's fine. You can rent it, that's fine. But for the same amount of money, you could have bought maybe a better property and gotten more upside to it if you're willing to put the effort in, all right? The best properties to purchase for refurbishment are larger apartments with high ceilings in the best areas with brand new, more expensive developments in close proximity. There's a couple of reasons for this. One of the, one of the most important reasons is why would you buy an older property, particularly if it's got a high ceiling? Has anyone ever been to a warehouse conversion? 
Anyone ever seen a warehouse conversion? New York lifestyle apartments? You've got a floor plate, but you know what they do? Kitchens generally have lower ceilings, correct? So they build the bedroom area above the kitchen. So now you've got more living spaces and maybe you've just added 50% more to your living area. One of my mates was doing a development, um, actually he didn't do the development, he bought into a development just off Crown Street. I've forgotten what it's called, it's a really famous one there. And what he found was it had a mezzanine level, so it had really high ceilings, a warehouse conversion, downstairs you had lounge, you know, bathroom, toilet, all that, upstairs you just had a bedroom. But this is what he decided to do. He could extend inside his own apartment all the way because the the glass went for the two stories. So it's floor to ceiling glass. Do you know what he did? He extended the floor plan upstairs to the glass. Nobody else cared in the building because it didn't affect anything in the building. It was just his property. That actually gave him about a third more floor space and an extra bedroom. Now, instead of being one bedroom, it was now a two-bedroom. Did he add substantial value to that, yes or no? Right? He actually had a lot of inspections done to see what was possible, made sure it was possible before he went ahead. It cost him a couple of hundred dollars in inspections from places like Archie Centre. I'm going to get them to talk to you later on. But he had a vision. He had a bigger tool belt than most other people looking at that property. And when he had a bigger tool belt, he could add more value to it over and above what other people can. And that's why being part of a syndicate is so important, because you're actually fertilising each other with, with different ideas. You're keeping each other motivated and accountable all the time. Does that make sense? Why else is this a good idea? To buy properties um, that are next to expensive devel- developments. Let me show you on the board here. When the government introduced a, a tax... That tax was called GST, right? When they introduced it, what you actually had was new properties were going to be subject to GST, old properties were not. Was that going to create a price difference, yes or no? That was an immediately a price difference, which immediately, think about this. If, if a, an existing property hits, existing properties 300000 and new properties are $330,000 because of the GST component. Now, it's not as simple as that because they actually worked out a way, um, and the people from the tax people will explain to you this, but it depends whether they make the option up front, whether or not they can do this. But there is a way to reduce their GST component, right? But that's a bit more advanced. We'll get to that. But I want you to think about this from comparable sales perspective. Yeah, they might get their 30 k back, so the net cost is still 300 k to them. But what number enters the public record? 330. If that's in the public record, what does that do to any existing valuations in that area? Just drags them up, doesn't it? So think about this. If you're in a suburb where there is lots of existing stock... There are two elements to this that you need to clearly understand. The first is the GST is going to just drag the prices up anyway. Even though the net cost may not drag it up as much, the GST and the way they've calculated it will drag it up. Is that a bonus for you if you're doing an existing property reno? Yes or no? All right? It's already a drag up. But number two, think about this. If they've just built, so as an example, Hornsby, who knows where Hornsby is? Northwest sector of Sydney. There's a company that went in there and they built all these multi-storey town, um, multi-storey units, right? Anyone know the brand name? Starts with M. No, it's not Metricon. They no, Mer- Meriton, right? They did a lot of development work up there, right? But if you went to their open for inspection, right? Let's just give you a sample of what you could have done as a syndicate, right? We haven't done all these concepts yet or strategies, but let me show you at a high level, what you could have done. Could you have picked a suburb as a syndicate, yes or no? Right, found out that there's high growth. Could you have found out what's in the DA channel? Could you have found out from local papers that the shopping centre has spent 10 years fighting local council for massive expansion? Because that's exactly what happened at Hornsby, at the Westfield, right? Because I I used to work at Kmart, and I know my Kmart stuff, right? All right, so anyway you knew that they weren't going to give up because Westfield, do they have deep pockets? 
right? Is it going to be worth their while commercially to make sure that area grows, yes or no? And who remembers the old west field there in Hornsby? Anyone remember that? It's a shadow of what it itself is now. It is massive. And they actually brought in some very high-end shops in there. Who does that attract, by the way? Rich people, okay? Or people with, with high disposable income. Now, could you have identified all those sorts of things as a syndicate beforehand, yes or no, with research? Absolutely. Could you have then had a different part of your syndicate checking out all the new developments in that area, getting a price list, getting a list of fixtures and fittings and finishes, yes or no? Of course you could have. Could you then have another group in your, in your committee, could it even be the same people, trying to find existing properties in that area, yes or no? Let's take it to the next level, because you couldn't take out a whole development yourself, could you? But as a syndicate, could you have found, through your research, a building that is owned by one person with several apartments in it, yes or no? Right? And let me tell you, I know some people, this is their only strategy. They look for buildings that have one owner, because is it easier to negotiate, excuse me, with one owner than 10 or 15 owners, yes or no? Right? Because... At that level, they're already commercial. They're not even emotionally tied to them as each individual would be to their property. Does that make sense? Right? So, could you have gone and done a deal with that owner to buy it out? Yes or no? Could you have then upgraded that building with all the fixtures and fittings and finishes that are similar to the new property being built? Yes or no? And you may have even found that yours is physically closer because it's an established property than the new one to to lifestyle areas and you know that that big one is going to cause massive traffic and con congestion and noise whereas yours is in an area that maybe has established homes that, that are owned by owner occupiers that are well looked after. Could you do a reno on that and get it revalved because you got in at a cheaper price and you just put the fixtures and fittings in, you've already know that, that there's a big price differentiation between existing stock and new stock. Could that be one of your organising principles that you look for? Where are the areas that new stock is coming on the market that there is a big differentiation between new versus existing price points? Could that be one of your organising principles, yes or no? Right? And then, could you actually do a takeout of a house or multiple houses or townhouses or units and refurbish them, maybe even change the outside, they look like bag the building, right? Cement, render it, right? Upgrade the fixtures and fittings and finishes to be similar to that of the new stock coming onto the market. Well, isn't your property now similar to those? Yes or no? But it's in a smaller, more boutique development. Does that appeal to some people? Yes or no? Who does it more appeal to? Invest, sorry, owner-occupiers or renters? It appeals to owner-occupiers more because they don't like to be lost in a very big thing that they know people are moving into and out of all the time that they don't get to know their neighbours. But something smaller and more boutique, more owner-occupiers prefer that. Owner-occupiers, will they pay an emotional premium, yes or no? Yes. yes. And you're likely to get a good quality tenant who wants to stay there long term also. Does that all make sense? So that's kind of an end-to-end -end strategy. We're obviously not there with all the principles and ideas yet. We're still working our way, but I wanted to give you a taste of what's possible at this level. Make sense? The price of the property will be dictated by the difference in price between your second-hand property and a similar size and position brand new property. I've covered that. You must allow for renovation costs to the inside and outside, including body corporate costs to the building. I will cover that in a bit more detail in one of the, the reno strategies, right? But as I said, I know some people, this is the only strategy they look for, Right? The price difference between existing stock and new stock in that area, because they know that they've got a lot of margin there, right? They just need to get their property looking something similar to the new ones. They can value up against that, and bang, they can get close to 100% finance. What does that do to your internal rate of return? It's through the roof. <laughs>